All right, well, let's continue to uh, prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth uh, and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer, and all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Well, people of God, uh, this is sort of a strange Sunday. Uh, so normally the Sunday after Thanksgiving is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Uh, the season when we prepare our hearts to receive Jesus uh, at, at Christmas time. Uh, but Thanksgiving was just a little bit early this year. Uh, so Advent technically doesn't start until next week. Uh, so Pastor Aaron Walters from The Table in Bellingham will be here next week. Uh, and he's going to jump us into the season of Advent. Uh, but that left us with this Sunday. We finished up this series on worship last week. Uh, so we had this one kind of strange in-between Sunday that was kind of like, I'm not exactly sure. Last week. This is what you get for bringing your phone up here. <laughs> I told you not to talk to me. <laughs> We're putting it way down there. That's fun. Now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, strange Sunday. Weird Sunday, okay? Uh, since it's a strange Sunday, since it's a weird Sunday, I thought, why don't we... Did it talk to me again? I thought I heard something. Okay. Uh, I thought, why don't we talk about a strange story? Okay? Uh, we can all admit, I think, that there are strange stories in the Bible, right? Uh, have you ever been like reading along in your scriptures, maybe with your devotions or a Bible study group or something, uh, and you think to yourself, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> or, or that's weird, or that certainly is different. Uh, and normally we kind of gloss over these things and say, well, I don't really understand what's going on, so I'm just going to move on. But today I wanted to look one kind of square in the face. So uh, I like doing this with some of these strange stories because I think it helps us think about the Bible in a fuller and a deeper way. Uh, we have a tendency, I think, as Christians, to kind of domesticate the Bible, right? We make it into this very neat and tidy package. Uh, we look at it maybe sometimes as something where we just go to for, uh, you know, an inspirational quote or, or when we need time, when we need help in a time of struggle or something like that. Uh, but, but the Bible is so much more than that. The Bible can't really be domesticated. The words of Scripture, we meet the living God. I want to say that again. Okay? In the words of Scripture, we meet the living God. The living God who is more magnificent and powerful and holy than we can ever imagine. There are stories in the Bible uh, that, that draw us into deeper relationship with God. And as we read the Bible, uh, there are stories that we like, right? That make us, we, we connect with it, we say, that's wonderful. And then, there are stories that we don't like, right? <laughs> We can be honest about this. There are stories that we read in the Bible that as we read them we think, I, I kind of wish that wasn't there. Right? Have you ever thought that about the Bible? It's okay to admit that. I've thought that about the Bible. I read that and I think, why does that have to be there? It's all going to be a lot simpler if this wasn't here. Right? But we don't get to meet Scripture, or we don't get to determine Scripture like that on our own terms. Right? Uh, we read Scripture and we wrestle with it and we, we move through the uncomfortableness of it. Uh, and all the while, we understand more of the heart of God. We have to keep that in mind as we read Scripture, that it's not about Scripture itself, okay? Scripture is not the fourth member of the Trinity, okay, as we sometimes like to make it out to be. Scripture is what points us to God. Scripture is what brings us into relationship with the living God. So with all of that stuff uh, on our hearts and on our minds, let's jump in. We're going to look at a story from 2 Kings this morning. 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, verses 23 through 25. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be surprised if you've heard a sermon on this before. Uh, I'm reading it from the updated NIV translation, so there will be a couple things that are just a little bit different uh, from your pew Bibles, but I think this translation is a little bit better. Uh, so this is what we're reading from. Uh, but it's just a couple of verses, uh, a little story about the prophet Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 25. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. 
as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there returned to Samaria. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Really? You want to say that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that story is a little bit out there, isn't it? Uh, it's not a story that gets included in a lot of children's Bibles. Uh, it's not one that I have uh, sat down and read with Evelyn and Jack and Walter before. Uh, uh, Elisha, Prophet Elisha, gets insulted and calls two bears out of the woods and mauls 40, and the bears maul 42 kids. Okay? What on earth is going on here? I told you this is going to be a strange story. What do we do with this story? Well, I want to begin with this. Uh, I want to begin with uh, reminding us of a basic principle of biblical interpretation. Okay, so whenever we go to the scriptures, there are certain principles, certain things that we have in our minds that help us make meaning, that help us understand what's going on in the text, that help us know more how to read it better. Uh, and one of, the, one of the most basic principles is that when we read the Bible, we have to keep the larger context of the story in mind. Okay? This is probably something that we've all heard before, uh, but we have to keep the larger context of the story in mind. The Bible can be very dangerous when we forget the larger context of the story, when we just take out uh, like one little verse or one little story and kind of do whatever we want with it. Okay? Uh, think about if I did that this morning. If we didn't consider the rest of the witness of Scripture, the, the bigger story that's going on here, I could read this story to you, just remove it from its context, and I could make a sermon about a couple different things. Uh, I could make a sermon about how calling someone baldy is an offense that requires death. Okay? I could preach that sermon to you, and I could be like, look, it's right here in our Scriptures, and I could pound the pulpit, and I could say, this is what the Lord says. Okay? I could also make it a sermon... Uh, about how we mustn't put up with insults to our appearance. Okay? Uh, I can make it a sermon about that. I can make a sermon about uh, bears being a holy animal, right? Designed by God to do his bidding. So, so we can't ever hurt bears because they're God's holy animals that he has chosen, right? Uh, if I preached any of those, all of you would probably say, uh, what's wrong with Marcus? <laughs> uh, I think he's off his rocker a little bit. Uh, it's because it's not a good way to treat scripture. Right? We can't just remove a story from its context and make it about anything we want to. So, we look at the chapter. We look at the book. We look at the testament. We look at the whole witness of Scripture. And we use the overall bigger story to help us make sense of the smaller one. Does that make sense? This is, this is kind of a basic principle of biblical interpretation. That we can't forget the context that we're reading in. So, uh, if we can't forget the larger story, the next question is, all right, what's the larger story here? If you still have your Bibles out, you can take a look, otherwise I'll walk you through it. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 is all about uh, the transition from the prophet Elijah to the prophet Elisha, his protege. Protege, excuse me. I knew I was going to mess up on words this morning because these names are so similar. Uh, this chapter is the transition from the prophet Elijah to the prophet Eli Elisha. Uh, so Elijah has for a long time been the prophetic voice in Israel. He has been the one to whom God spoke, uh, the one to whom the people went to, to discern the word of the Lord, the one who brought God's word to the people. Right? He was the mouthpiece of God. That's what prophets were in the Old Testament. Uh, so at the beginning of this chapter, we see that the end of Elijah's ministry is near. The, the chapter, chapter 2, starts out by saying, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to, up to heaven. It's pretty clear what's about to happen, right? Elijah's ministry is done. And so a transition is going to take place. At the beginning of the chapter, Elijah is with Elijah. Uh, and he's planning on being with him until the end, until God takes him up to heaven. And before he goes up, he asks Elisha, uh, What can I do for you before I'm taken from you? It's a chance for Elisha to make like one 
last final request. And he says, Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Essentially what Elisha is asking uh, is to become like Elijah. To become a prophet of God. To take on the mantle of being the mouthpiece of God in that community. To be the one who would bring God's message to the Israelites. That's his request. And so Elijah tells him, okay, if you see me taken up to heaven, then you will receive that. Sure enough, a couple verses later, uh, Elisha sees Elijah taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, and this mantle of prophetic ministry is passed on from Elijah to Elisha. Okay, so this time of transition comes with, uh, as you might expect, a little bit of apprehension from the people. Uh, Elijah and Elisha had just gone off together, and when they come back, Elijah's not there anymore. So Elisha comes back to this company of prophets, and they say, you know, wh where's Elijah? And Elisha says, no, I'm the prophet now, just listen to me. Uh, and they say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, so what they do is they put on a three-day search. They send 50 people out for three days to look for Elijah. They want to find him. They want to know that he's, he hasn't been hurt somewhere. But after three days, they don't find Elijah. So at this point in the story, uh, I, I hope you're still with me here. Uh, at this point in the story, God has passed on the prophetic responsibility to Elisha. But the people aren't exactly convinced yet. And this makes sense, right? They've been listening to Elijah for so long. They don't know if they can trust this new prophet. They don't know if God is really truly with him. So chapter 2 ends with two stories. And these two stories serve as a way for Elisha to kind of demonstrate his prophetic power. There are two stories right at the end of this chapter that essentially prove to the people that God was with Elisha. That the prophetic mantle that was once on Elijah now rests with him. Uh, the first story happens just before our text for today. Uh, and it's a story of Elisha throwing salt into a spring of water. Uh, and he makes that water clean by doing this. Okay, before the, the water was bad, it was unproductive, so the land wasn't fertile. Uh, and he throws this salt in and he makes the water clean. So Elisha demonstrates that the power of God is with him by healing this water. He demonstrates God's power to bless and to heal and to lift up and to make new. And then the story right after that is the one that we just heard. Elisha calls down a curse upon some youths, and 42 of them are mauled by bears. So at its core, this story is really about confirming Elisha's newly inherited prophetic power. It's about uh, confirming to all the people there that the power of God that once rested with Elijah now rests with Elisha. It's, the power, it's a demonstration that the power of God is with him, not only to bless, as he does with the healing of the water, but the power of God is also with him to curse uh, and to bring down curses upon other people. Uh, you know, not just anyone could call down a curse and have two bears come out of the woods and do their bidding for him. The power of God now was resting with Elisha. This story, this weird story at the end, confirms to the people gathered there, to the people of Israel, that the power of God uh, was now resting on Elisha. The transition of power had been made. Okay, so that's our context. Now, uh, at this point, we might be wondering, all right, uh, I understand that, uh, and I see that the power of God was transferred, and that it had been proven, and all that stuff. I get that. But isn't there a better way to communicate that? Don't you think God could have thought of a different way to do this, rather than, you know, having 42 bears come out and maul these young children? Uh, isn't there a better way for Elisha to confirm his newly inherited power, rather than to get mad because somebody insulted his appearance? Uh, and the answer to that, I think, is, well, sure, there might be. Uh, but that's the thing about the Bible, is we don't get to choose what's there. We don't get to choose how God demonstrates his power. We don't get to choose how God makes a transition from one prophet to the next. God chooses that. God does what God does, and we are left to kind of wrestle with that. And sometimes we're left to be a little bit uncomfortable 
with that. And we're left to think, boy, you know, if I were God, I, I maybe would do things a little bit differently. <coughs> it's a good reminder for us that, hey, guess what? We're not God. We're left uh, with something called the sovereignty of God. So sovereignty is just a big kind of fancy theological term, but basically it means that God has the power and the freedom to do whatever God wants. God does what God does. God will do what God will do. God is sovereign over us. He's not beholden to us. Now, uh, this story reminds us of that. But there's one other little thing that I want to point out. Uh, is that this story, it, it confirms this transition, but it also calls for proper respect and awe of God's power. Uh, in the ancient world that this story takes place in, uh, the prophets were the mouthpieces of God. I've used that phrase a couple of times. They were the representatives of God in that community. Uh, so to insult God's prophet was to insult God, was to insult the mouthpiece of God. The way that God interacted with the Israelite people was much more uh, kind of regimented than it is today. Right? They had sacrifices, they had temple, they had priests, they had prophets. Uh, they didn't have this kind of direct access that we have to God after, after Christ tore the curtain in two with his death, right? Uh, so all of that was different in the Old Testament. So to mock or to insult one of God's prophets was to mock or to insult God. So the kids in the story, they mocked Elisha. They mocked his appearance, call him baldy, tell him to get out of there. They knew it twice, right? In case you didn't hear it the first time, they're going to say the exact same thing again. And so Elisha demonstrates the power of God by calling down a curse upon these kids. For ancient readers and hearers of this story, uh, they wouldn't have been so much focused on the kids in the story. It would have been a story about a healthy respect for the power of God. So you might be wondering this morning, all right, Marcus, what, what do I do with all this? <laughs> this is all very interesting, right? This is all very nice. This is all very kind of uh, fascinating to look at in different ways. But, but what do I do with this? What do I do with this story? Well, I want to resist something this morning. Uh, I want to resist summing this up for you in a nice kind of take-home, easy thing that you can put in your pocket and just walk out of because that's domesticating the Bible. And I don't want to do that. Uh, I want you to kind of wrestle with this a little bit. I think this story calls on us to reflect on the power of God and the sovereignty of God. Think about, you know, we sing of the power of God. We've already sung of it today. You know, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Uh, we sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, built the lofty skies. We sing that God can do all of these things, and we also recognize that God is sovereign and has complete freedom over us. And so we're left to say, all right, what do we do with that? How do we live in a world where we trust in God's power and trust in God's sovereignty? That's what I want to leave us with today. I don't want to wrap this story up in three nice points for you. I want, to, I want you to wrestle with the power of God. Where do you see the power of God displayed in this world? Where do you see the power of God displayed in your own life? Do you always see the power of God displayed in ways that you think are great and wonderful and perfect? Or, or do you sometimes do you see the power of God displayed in ways that, that you wish maybe it wouldn't be? which maybe things were just a little bit different. We don't get to choose how God demonstrates his power in this world. God does. God is sovereign. God is free. God can do what God will do. And so we are left then to trust, to believe, to have faith, to, to cast our lot with this God that we love so much, and to cast our lot with this God uh, who loves us, and who, in all of his freedom and sovereignty, chose to become one of us. Chose to demonstrate his power and his love by walking the way of suffering. By walking the way of humility. By walking the way of vulnerability. By walking the way of death. And he chose to demonstrate his power over death by rising again 
from the dead, and not establishing a, an earthly kingdom where he rules on a throne and, and, and you know gets rid of all his enemies. No, but to establish a kingdom based on love, based on self-sacrifice, based on compassion, based on mercy, a kingdom based on grace. This is how God has chosen to display his power. God has demonstrated his power in the world. The question is, how would we respond? Right. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning uh, in awe of your power. God, we read a story like this from 2 Kings and we think, what in the world is going on? God, how could you display your power like that? How could you do that? But God, we don't know you. We don't know the, the depths of your heart. But God, we trust you, and we believe in your goodness, and we believe in your faithfulness, even when with our own eyes we can't see it. God, we trust in you every single day, and we thank you also for uh, the, the ways that you do display your power, for how we see your power in Jesus, uh, in overcoming death and bringing us back to life and, and winning the victory of salvation for us how we see your power in, uh, in the protection that we've experienced in our own lives, in all these different stories of faithfulness and goodness that we can live out, uh, that we can retell over and over and over again. God, we pray now that your spirit would give us eyes to see you, eyes to see your power in the world, uh, and eyes to be in awe of you, and hearts to trust you, to walk with you, uh, to cast our lot with you, not just here this morning in this place, but to cast our lot with you day in and day out. God, as we respond now to this word, as we bring our gifts and our offerings, as we, uh, as we sing, as we pray, as we are sent out to be your hands and feet, God, may your spirit pervade in our hearts, and may your spirit remind us of your power and your goodness every day. We pray this all in Jesus' name, and all God's people together said, Amen. Amen.